Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead now um, into what is very important for many patients is uh, what to do uh, if there has been a, a relapse occur. And uh, the good news is that we really have a lot of options. Uh, and, and the question is frequently, which of these various options would be recommended in a particular uh, setting? And so uh, in slide number 20, I've just kind of summarized what are the options in uh, an early relapse setting uh, with the key discriminator uh, based upon uh, the maintenance which would typically have been used, which would be lenalidomide and whether a patient has become refractory to lenalidomide or not refractory to lenalidomide. In other words, uh, if, if the disease has progressed uh, despite the, the, the use of Revlimid and uh, what would be uh, recommended, or if there is uh, felt to be some continued uh, sensitivity to, to lenalidomide and what would be uh, recommended. And so uh, the, uh, the exciting information is obviously the availability of daratumumab RevDex uh, and then also uh, the, uh, the option for uh, Kyprolis uh, 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 daratumumab, uh, which actually was was just recently approved, uh, and so uh, a few options to talk about there. And then for patients who are uh, refractory uh, to to lenalidomide, uh, the 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 pomalidomide options, uh, the daratumumab proteasome inhibitor options. Uh, and then options uh, for patients who are more uh, frail. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm not sure who would like to go first on this. Uh, maybe, maybe Rafat, would you like to, to comment first on how, how do you approach um, uh, or what are your preferred choices for the refractory and not refractory uh, patients? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, uh, we treat a patient, you know, based individually. I mean, each, you know, that's the, yes. the good thing is that we really have several options that will address patient preference, patient medical conditions, and the type of relapse, the biology of their disease. So I think, yes. you know, your algorithm here is, you know, interesting based on refractory versus non refractory. But also we have to pay attention to, is it biochemical relapse? Just your myeloma markers are going right. up. Are you having a symptomatic relapse? You know, what your preference, oral regimens versus, you know, uh, intravenous uh, regimen, you know, and uh, the medical conditions of the patient, how far they live from the clinic and things like that. So there are a lot of good options, I think, and, and those, you know, require that the treating physician sit down with the patient and address all of them, you know, and, and take the time to make that decision. Clearly, I mean, right. I think, very, very you know, in, point. even in the yeah. relapse setting, yeah, in the relapse setting, even in the relapse setting, I think triplets are superior to doublets. So I, I rarely use doublet in the, in the relapse setting. I'd like to use, you know, triplets, you know, so a monoclonal antibody with, uh, you know, either pomelomide or lenalidomide and, and, and yeah. pick the right proteasome maybe in, the, in that combination. I find that uh, pomelomide is a very good, you know, pomelis is a very good immunomodulated drugs. It's easier to use. You can manage the side effect quickly. So I like to use it in combination. Um, monoclonal antibodies, you know, in that relapse setting that can be used. Uh, so it's the patient preference, the type of relapse, the biology of their relapse will influence any of those, you know, combination that you put on the slide, slide 20. Right, right. Yeah, uh, you made a number of very, very important points, uh, the patient preference, and then I think particularly important, uh, the, the use of a triplet versus a, a, a doublet. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, a, a pomalidomide-based uh, regimen, uh, especially for a refractory uh, to lenalidomide patient. And so, so Paul, uh, what, what perspectives would you give uh, for a patient? 
I think um, Refrat, you know, I fully agree with all the comments from Refrat that really, you know, rarely do we necessarily go to just a doublet. The doublets can sometimes be valuable in the setting of biochemical progression and where you're minimizing toxicity. But I fully agree with Refrat that a, you know, three or four drug platform makes sense in the relapse setting because it's to, to sort of paraphrase the, the old quote, that, you know, relapse disease is guilty until proven innocent. And I think that that's a, an important paradigm. I think in addition to the, the comments, I mean, I absolutely agree with Rafat about POM. It's a very uh, uh, useful drug in this setting uh, as a backbone. And obviously we've got the enormous benefits of, you know, after upfront bortezomib, we can then deploy carfilzomib, we've got exazomib, all of those gives us good choices. I think the interesting part of the slide, uh, Brian, which is, is very informative is, you know, if they're a refractory, you know, what do we do? I think that's become a new challenge because obviously we've generated strategies to tackle lenalidomide failure, but when daratumumab fails a patient, what do we do? And I, I think right. that's an important area in the relapse setting. And I think there the, the combinations you suggest are excellent. You know, we will often use carfilzomib with cyclophosphamide as a platform there. And now obviously with the approval of isotoxamab, there's an opportunity to bring that in. Uh, but of course, also, um, there are other options, uh, and I'm sure you're coming on to this, um, Brian, but there yeah. are new drugs like Selenexor that you could think about, because I do think right. that our country population really, really worry me. You know, that's a population in whom disease can behave very badly once Dara has failed a patient, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's an area of importance. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I'm glad you emphasized the point in the setting of the DARA refractory, because I see some questions coming up related to that, and it is uh, in, encouraging. Uh, and uh, e even um, I think that uh, maybe you could comment on the, the value of the, the ELO palm decks uh, combination. I have to say I was quite surprised to see that this was uh, quite beneficial in this setting. It's, it's fascinating, Brian, and I'm glad you raised it. This is the Eloquent 3 trial. Now, the Eloquent 3 trial combined elatuzumab with pomalidomide and DEX and showed a striking difference in favor of the three drugs over the pomalidomide DEX platform. So after darabumumab uh, runs out of benefit for a patient, there may be a role for ELO-based platforms. I think the natural killer cell activity is the key, and the fact that in the ELO-POM-DEX platform, which is FDA-approved, um, there is, um, you know, a relatively deck sparing approach. This may be very important because, as you may know, Brian, the Eloquent Upfront study, um, the Eloquent One study, um, yep. the, the, the press release was that there was no uh, significant difference seen between the two arms, ELO RD versus RD. I think one of the issues right. there could well be the dexamethasone dosing, as well as, frankly, the pomalidomide is much more of an NK cell activator. Uh, clinically than lenalidomide is, although both do it, but on to a great extent. So ELO can be very useful. I personally, I'd love Rafat's comments on this too. When I use ELO after DARA failure, um, I will basically go ELO POM plus an, a proteasome inhibitor because I, I feel you need probably more than just the EPD. Right, right, right. Okay, and so I've, I flipped forward to the next slide, 21, which uh, includes some of these uh, additional uh, options uh, that you were starting to touch on, Paul, including obviously uh, the Selenexor and uh, some of the other, well, the, the uh, Isotuximab Palm Dex, which was recently approved, et cetera. Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know um, if uh, uh, there can be any added comments about these additional options. Um, oh, sure. Uh, sure no, I'd, I'd welcome Rafat if you'd like to start, and then I can come in because there's, this is a great slide, Brian. Thank you for for bringing it forward. There's a lot here to discuss for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I, obviously I we have. We were yeah. Touching on uh, uh, sort of the new. Um, uh, Paul, you were, you know, initially you were going to talk about some of these new in, in clinical yes. trials, so the CAR T cell by specific antibodies. Uh, yeah. I, and, and the rest. So I, you know, I'll let you do that. But, you know, I just, again, I mean, you know, we have options, you know. And so when somebody relapses, I, I love the way you said it that, you know, relapse is guilty until proven otherwise, especially early relapse. Um, you know, you want to try to get rid of the disease. And so 
triplet, quadruplet, whatever is appropriate for the patients and based on their medical conditions, we should try. I mean, because, you know, every time the patient relapses, we do not do as well with subsequent relapses. If we don't get it right the first time, we have to get it right the second time. So when the patient yeah. relapses, let's give them the best chance to get into a remission, to get into MRD negative. So there are a lot of good options, you know, and again, it's not going to be, you know, uh, in, in somebody who has an early relapse, you're not going to go with two drug regimen because probably you're not going to be able to control the disease. Try to get the disease under control, three drug regimen, four drug regimens, and then you can start backing off to a maintenance regimen that is not a four drug regimen. So right. it's a great option. You can see all these drugs here. Um, you know, so let's get it right uh, at the first relapse. Very, very yeah. good. And perhaps, Paul, I could ask you first, um, just for your thoughts. Uh, on this slide here, we have the Selenexor, and my impression is that since the approval of Selenexor um, and the use has spread in the community, um, the results I have been hearing have actually been uh, surprisingly good or perhaps better than had been anticipated related to concerns about toxicity and the like. Uh, well, what is your feeling about um, what has happened with the availability of Selenexor? Yeah, I, I completely agree, Brian. I, I think what people have to understand is that in the STORM study that uh, it was a, a privilege to be part of, um, we, we had to go for an accelerated approval offering a combination of two drugs, Selenexor and dexamethasone, to patients in whom every other uh, drug class had failed them. And so, therefore, we were up against a real, you know, real hurdle. And the fact that a response rate was seen, and in, in patients who responded, there was durable responses that were clinically very meaningful, was remarkable. And that provided us the accelerated approval. And we then had at the Ash meeting an excellent presentation by Dr. Christine, Christine Chen uh, from Toronto, where she showed that the combination of uh, selenexor and pomalidomide was particularly effective and actually quite well tolerated. To your point, Brian particularly with the uh, weekly dosing. And now finally, we have the results of the Boston trial, uh, which again, it was a, a privilege to be part of, in which we showed, and this was led by uh, Nazir uh, Abelis, um, uh, uh, but basically Nizar, Nizar showed that um, uh, the, the combination of um, uh, bortezomib, selenexor and dexamethasone, um, provided a substantial clinical benefit over the control group. Now, what was really interesting in the Boston trial is that we designed it so that the bortezomib would be given weekly and certainly weekly. And in this context, the toxicity of the regimen of the, of the experimental arm was substantially improved, actually. Uh, less neuropathy was one of the key findings. And so as a result of that, um, you know, this is going to be very exciting data going forward because it shows that this platform um, you know, could be very beneficial to patients. So I think people are aware that the Boston study, that there was a public announcement about it and some of these details were shared. Right, and exactly. Hopefully, we're looking forward to um, being able to share more information. But it gets to your point, Brian, that, you know, when we use it, when I, I use it uh, as it's approved, frankly, I use it weekly. I typically combine it with either bortezomib or carfilzomib. There's this very nice data from various investigators on that, Dr. Christina Gasparetto actually did some lovely work with Selenexor and Carfilzomib. And, you know, between these combinations, Selenexor is, uh, is, is delivering a new mechanism of action, which I think can be very important. Very, very good. Okay.